Good morning. We're going to be finishing up our series on Ephesians this morning. We're in chapter 6, looking at verses 10 through 20. You may want to pause and go ahead and read those yourself, because I'm not going to read the whole passage to you. I'm just going to comment on it. Um, and then, you know, you can print out the notes and have those with you so you can follow along, and you'll be able to keep up. So, here we go. In verse 10, Paul simply says, be strong in two ways. He says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, I want to point out that he says, be strong in the Lord, not for the Lord. It may sound like a minor point, but uh, we can fall into that trap if we're not careful of trying to be strong for God. And the truth is, you can't, I can't, we really have nothing in regards to strength to offer him. Um, we're not called to be strong for him. We're called to be strong in him. In other words, it's what we talked about in Ephesians chapters 1 through 3 about how we position ourselves in him where our inheritance is, where our empowerment is, all those things. And so being strong in the Lord is about our position, us in him. And uh, that phrase, I think, is really important because we see it so much. We see in him four times just in Ephesians chapter 1. We see it 21 times in the book of 1 John. And of course, my favorite place, John 15, we're told to abide in him because uh, apart from him, we can do nothing. So it's very important that we're in him. And we started out in uh, Ephesians chapter 1 and 2 with this principle that we're building on now. Remember, the first three chapters, uh, we talked about our position in him. Uh, chapters 4 and 5, we talked about walking out our life from that position in him. And then here in chapter 6, we're going to talk about standing in that position in him. And so what we learned in Ephesians 1, 3 is that every spiritual blessing is there for us, but it's in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And then in Ephesians 2, 6, we learned that we have been seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So in other words, as we position ourselves in him, we obtain every spiritual blessing that's available through that. And then the second way he tells us to be strong is in the power of his might, not our strength, his strength. Again, uh, we talked about this in the early part of Ephesians, about grace and how grace is empowerment. And so we're being strong in the power of his might. We're being strong in his empowerment by his spirit of grace. Uh, in other words, in the first part, uh, we're being strong in the Lord, us in him. In the second part, we're being strong in the power of his might, him in us. It's what Colossians 1.27 talked about, the mystery that's been hidden through the ages that's now been revealed, Christ in us, the hope of glory. So we're uh, abiding in him and we're looking for his power, relying on his power in us in the hope of seeing his glory manifest in our lives. Now, there are two apostolic prayers that we see in Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 3, and uh, there are three phrases that I want to pull out of those just to remind you about this uh, power of his might thing. In Ephesians 1, Paul prayed that we would know the exceeding greatness of his power toward us. Uh, it says, I want you to know how great his power is and that it's directed toward you. So this uh, power of his might, this strengthening. In uh, the prayer in Ephesians 3, he says two things. He begins with a prayer that we would be strengthened with might through his spirit in our inner man. So that, again, we see that uh, the spirit of God dwelling in us strengthens us with the might, with the power of God. And then he ends that prayer with saying that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. So God is all powerful. The throttle, the bottleneck, the governor, the governor that might slow things down, if you will, is uh, that it works in us. It's how much of his power is going to be allowed to work in us. And so uh, we're exhorted to be strong in the Lord, position ourselves, us in him, and in the power of his might, his empowerment, him in us. In other words, being strong, strength, is abiding in him and relying on him in us. Now, again, that may seem like, well, yeah, sure, we rely on God. 
But it's easy to miss this. It's easy to get into self-reliance and not realize we're doing it. In other words, it's easy to get into uh, a mode of where we're doing things for him instead of uh, looking for him to do things through us. We were never called to do things for him. We're called to allow him to do things through us. Make sense? All right. Want to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might and have muscles? You need the Bible Build-Up Workout. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No weapon formed against me will prosper. Order yours today. Now, in verses 11 through 13, again, uh, Paul says it three or four ways, but it's pretty simple. He just says, put on the armor of God so that you'll be able to stand against the devil. It's very clear. Put the armor of God on so that you can stand uh, now, stand is different than run after or run away. Uh, he's just saying, just hold your position. Stand against the devil. Don't be moved out of position. You don't have to chase him around, uh, but don't let him chase you around. Stand. And he also uh, goes out of his way to make it clear, we don't battle against flesh and blood. We're not battling people. If you're fighting people, you're doing something wrong. Uh, we're standing against the devil. Now, uh, he uses that word stand four times just in those three verses. So uh, it's a very big deal. There's other places in the Bible where he talks about standing firm and things like that. Um, and again, it goes to this concept that we have been given a position in Christ and that we're to stand in it and not be moved off of it. So all he's saying is don't be moved off your position of authority and power in Christ. Just stay there. Stand there. Don't let Christ move you out of that position. I'm sorry, don't let the devil move you out of that position in Christ. Uh, the devil doesn't tempt us to sin so much as get us out of Christ and we take care of sin on our own. Uh, so uh, there's a verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, actually two verses right at the end that I want to read to you uh, that I think really uh, give us a nugget here that we can hold on to. He says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable. In other words, stand. Now, uh, catch what that verse is saying. We have been given the victory through Jesus Christ. So just stand, just stay there. We don't have to win. We just have to stay standing in the place of victory. If the devil comes to pick a fight and goes winner take all, you go, great, uh, but I'm not going to fight. I'm just going to stand in Jesus and I take all. All right? So uh, we've been given the victory. We don't have to win. We just have to stand in the position in the place of victory. You need to understand that the devil is op opportunistic. He's looking for vulnerability. Uh, in 1 Peter chapter 5, it talks about how he uh, roams about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Uh, who can, who's vulnerable? You know how uh, they'll attack a herd and get the, the animal that's uh, limping and running slow and, and is vulnerable. Well, he's like that. He's looking for someone who's vulnerable. And the roars are lies uh, because he is a liar. He is the father of lies. It's his chief weapon. And so he just roars lies and sees who is vulnerable. Who's going who's gonna to believe these lies? Who's going to... Uh, step out of their position in Christ so that I can attack them and begin to take them down. And so you have to know, and we've talked about this before when we talked about spiritual warfare, that standing in our position in Christ is a mindset. We see this really clearly in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verses 3 through 5, uh, where Paul says, uh, Though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare aren't carnal or earthly, they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. And I believe that's mental strongholds uh, because of the next couple of verses. Uh, casting down vain imaginations, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. In other words, we're taking lies uh, and strongholds captive and uh, we're casting them down and we're we're conforming our thoughts to Christ. We're doing war in our minds to win this battle. We're standing against the enemy, and it's primarily uh, a mindset. So I want you to keep that in mind as we go into the
the verses on the armor of God. Now, verses 14 through 18, I'm not going to read them. They just list the armor. I want you to see a couple things right off the bat, though. First of all, there are seven pieces, not six. Uh, the reason people say six is because there's six pieces of armor listed, and the seventh thing doesn't have a piece of armor listed. It just lists the thing. Now, the armor is not that important here, guys. The armor is a metaphor. Paul is using a metaphor. Don't get hung up on the metaphor. It's, uh, it's what the armor represents that's important. And the seventh piece just doesn't have a metaphor. There's still seven things here. And what these are, these are things that are going to enable us to stand. He says to put on the armor so that you can stand. They're going to enable us to stand because they help keep us mentally in the position that we're supposed to be in, in Christ. Now, uh, what happens is people can get hung up on the armor. And I, I know I've heard uh, people, and I've done this before, where you get up and you go, I'm going to pray through the armor of God and put on the armor of God before I go out in my day this morning. And that's not bad. It's a good thing to do. It's a good reminder. But it does no good if I, for example, pray, God, I put on the belt of truth, and then I walk out the door and believe a lie. It's not like there's some mystical belt of truth keeping that lie from having impact on me. Putting on the belt of truth means I'm rejecting lies. And so don't get caught up in the armor. Uh, the armor's a metaphor. Let's make sure we understand what it's telling us to do uh, and how it protects us. And remember that these things are going to help to keep us mentally in our position in Christ. I want you to see that as we go through these. So we're just going to look at these seven pieces. The first is the belt of truth. Um, and uh, I love the, the picture. A belt is what you hang all your tools and weapons and everything on. Keep your pants up. Without your belt, you can't tie everything together. So this is important. And truth is important. Truth is what ties everything together. Truth is what we hang everything on. Um, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, um, Paul says that at the end times, there will be a, a, a people who have entered into lawlessness because they were deceived because they did not have a love of the truth. It's not enough that we just go, uh, well, I've got some truth here, or I know truth, or whatever. We have to love truth. We have to want truth. We have to be willing to examine things that are being said and lived out and go, is this truth? I want to evaluate it. So uh, the love of the truth will keep us from deception. Sometimes that means some work and some digging. And so there's this belt of truth that we put on the desire to love truth so that we won't be deceived. This is pretty obvious. Truth keeps us from being deceived. The second thing he talks about is the breastplate of righteousness. This knowing that we are righteous guards our heart and enables us to move forward in confidence. Now, there are two types of righteousness in the Bible. Uh, one is what we call imputed righteousness. We see that in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, where Paul says, uh, he made him who knew no sin, Jesus, to be sin for us, that's the cross, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Literally, when Christ took our sins on the cross, he erased all of our sins and imputed righteousness to us. We can actually stand before God and go, yes, I am totally righteous, not because I didn't do anything wrong, because Jesus took everything I did wrong and nailed it to the cross and it's gone. And so we have this imputed righteousness. But we're also told in 2 Timothy to, or I'm sorry, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, to pursue righteousness. So uh, it sounds like a contradiction. Well, if I've been made righteous, why do I have to pursue righteousness? Well, we don't pursue righteousness in the way you might think. Uh, we don't uh, chase after trying to make ourselves righteous. We pursue it by pursuing our position in Christ where we have been made a new creation, where we have been made righteous. Remember Romans 6. We reckon ourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Galatians 5, 16. Um, uh, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. It doesn't say pursue righteousness by trying not to fulfill the lusts of the flesh. It says pursue righteousness by walking in the Spirit, by pursuing that position in Christ where we've been made righteous. The real you is the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And when we get out of position and there's unrighteousness in our life, we pursue it by just repenting and going back. All right? And so this guards our hearts. This is the breastplate of righteousness. It, it guards us. It gives us confidence. Uh, I wish I could go off on a tangent here. There's so many cool things in the Bible that, uh, that righteousness uh, sets us up for. 
uh, but I'm going to resist it. The next thing we see is our feet are shod with the gospel of peace. Uh, you know, shoes are what you run around in. So this speaks of uh, everywhere we go, we carry with us the gospel of peace. It speaks of a preparation to impart grace to others. Now, the gospel of peace is essentially this. And we see this in uh, 2 Corinthians 5. We have been made ambassadors of Christ, and we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. It's very clear. So I think the gospel of peace is really just going, look, everywhere I go, I'm my feet are shot with the gospel of peace. Everywhere I go, I am aware that I'm an ambassador for Jesus and that I'm supposed to be bringing peace. I'm supposed to be reconciling people to God. Remember verse 12, we don't fight against flesh and blood. I'm not fighting people. When I see devils, I stand and I resist them. When I see people, I bring peace and I reconcile them. If we're fighting with people uh, about the gospel, we're doing something wrong. That's not the gospel of peace. That doesn't mean you don't ever get in an argument. Uh, you do the best you can. But our heart needs to be, I'm here to be an ambassador for Christ and to bring reconciliation between you and Jesus. That is what it means to, to walk around the gospel of peace. And that mindset helps us uh, go into our relationships with others. And then the next one is uh, the shield of faith. Of course, you hold the shield up to protect yourself from all kinds of stuff. And uh, it says we protect ourselves from the fiery darts of the enemy. It doesn't say what those darts are. I think they're lies, mostly. And here's why. Uh, one, again, he's the father of lies. But if he can get us to believe a lie... He's typically lying about God or uh, our position in Christ or who we are in him or um, usually wants to condemn us. He's the accuser of the brethren. You're doing this wrong. God doesn't love you. You're a knucklehead, blah, blah, blah. And if he can get us to believe these lies, he can get us in unbelief and he can get us out of our position in Christ. And so this shield of faith is pulling up this shield and going, no, I'm trusting God. I'm trusting what God says. I'm going to quench all these lies with the truth of God. I'm going to keep saying, look, I trust God, especially because the devil loves to lie to us about stuff we don't understand. Why did that happen? Where was God when that happened? I don't know. And you don't have an answer to that question. And he'll try and twist you around the axle with it. So you just hold up the shield of faith and go, I don't know, but I have faith that he's good and that he loves me and it's okay. And I'm not going down that road with you, devil. So the shield of faith quenches the fiery darts, these lies that our opportunistic devil uh, tries to use, uh, tries to roar at us to see if he can devour us and get us off track. Then it goes on uh, to, with the helmet of salvation. I like this because, again, we said spiritual warfare is in our mind, and, of course, the helmet's, you know, guarding your brain, uh, guarding your head. The helmet of salvation, it's important that we know, not just that we're saved, but what that purchased for us, and all kinds of things. We know that on the cross, uh, salvation means healing, deliverance, freedom, all those things. But mostly, I want to remind you of what we saw in the beginning of Ephesians. In Ephesians 1, verse 5 and 6. In verse 5, he calls us adopted sons and daughters. And in verse 6, he says, you're accepted in the beloved. So I think putting on the helmet of salvation is walking around guarding our mind with the assurance that no matter what, I am accepted in the family of God. If I do well today, if I don't do well today, I am accepted in the family of God. And I'm going to just continually position myself in him and in that. There's tremendous confidence in guarding our mind with the knowledge that we are accepted in the beloved. We're part of the family. We've been adopted into God's family. Of course, the next one, the sword of the Spirit, really the only offensive weapon that's listed here, uh, the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. It's a sword. It's what we use to cut. Again, we're just standing. We're not chasing the devil around. But uh, the sword of the Spirit is what we use to defeat him when he comes against us. Couldn't have a more clear picture of this than Matthew chapter 4. Jesus is led by the Spirit out into the wilderness. Satan shows up and tempts him three times. And each time... Jesus responds with, it is written, and he quotes scripture. The word of God is the sword of the spirit. Jesus stood, he just drew his sword, whack, 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 and we were done. The devil left him 
uh, because he's got three shots and then he has to move on. He'll come back at a more opportune time, it says. So uh, the sword of the Spirit is just the word of God used offensively to resist the lies of the devil. Now, if you have issues in your life, and we all do, and you don't have a verse that deal with those issues, you're not really prepared. Your sword is, it's great that you've got a Bible at home, but uh, you need your sword with you when you're out and about and the devil attacks you, or if you find yourself in the wilderness and the devil attacks you, right? So uh, the sword of the spirit specifically can mean we are memorizing verses that deal with issues. If I have an issue with fear, I memorize a verse that renews my mind in fear so that when the devil comes and attacks me with fear, I can say, it is written, and I can use the sword of the Spirit against him. I love James uh, chapter 4, verse 7, where Jesus says, uh, or I'm sorry, James says, uh, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We've just seen the way we resist the devil is with the word of God. Uh, the way we submit to God is just by reading his word and saying, yes, amen, I believe it, I'm going to do it. So what I love is it doesn't even matter if you feel like you're under attack and you don't know if it's the devil or yourself or just the flesh or just stuff, just use the word of God. You're either submitting to God or resisting the devil. Either way, it's the same tool. So just use the word of God. Now, uh, the final, the seventh one, which we don't have a, a, a piece of armor for as a metaphor, is prayer. But it's clearly in there. It's, the, it's all one sentence. There's a comma there, not a period. So he tells us to pray. And he tells us to pray always. I think that simply means pray about everything. Uh, every time something comes up, pray about it. Don't take anything on on your own. Always involve God. And he tells us to pray with perseverance. Uh, reminds me of the Luke 18, the parable of persistent widow. Keep praying until you have some form of resolution. And then finally, he says, pray in the Spirit. Uh, he says, uh, praying in the Spirit will be like the armor. It will keep you, uh, it will defend you uh, from the evil one. It'll help you to stand. It'll keep you in your position in Christ. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14 makes it really clear that praying in the Spirit is praying in tongues. So uh, can't make this any simpler. I encourage you to pray in tongues a lot. If you don't pray in tongues and you want to, we can teach you about that. We can help you. We can pray for you at another time. Uh, but I pray in tongues a lot because it builds us up on our most holy faith, as Jude says. And uh, it helps us to stand in that place in Jesus. Amen? Still have an order the Bible build up workout? Act now and we'll throw in a shield of faith. You want to collect all six pieces. Do not get shield wet. Finishing up with verses 19 and 20, uh, Paul basically just says, hey, while you're praying, would you guys pray for me? He says, I'm an ambassador in chains. He was in prison, writing this book from prison, remember? He says, but I, I want you to pray that I would speak the word boldly, that I would communicate the gospel. Uh, and what I love about that is that Paul uh, whatever's going on in his life, he maintains his position as an ambassador of Christ, and he maintains his ministry as an evangelist, regardless of the circumstances he's in, which, of course, are jail at this point. Now, uh, we can take a little bit away from this. Um, Paul was standing, uh, even though he was in jail, and it's not the first time. Remember, uh, in Philippi when he was uh, when the jail was shaking because they were praising at midnight uh, Paul had learned to stand in whatever circumstances he was in to maintain his position in Christ I'm an ambassador I'm here for the gospel I'm, I'm staying in my ministry even if they put me in jail and uh, so our takeaway from this is uh, remember we aren't promised to be kept from suffering uh, it's just Part of the human condition people are going to suffer uh some of us are suffering a little bit now because of this whole pandemic thing um for a lot of us it's probably just inconvenience for some it might be more uh it's just the human condition there's suffering built into life uh even more so uh paul told timothy in second timothy 3 that all who desire to live godly in christ jesus will suffer persecution your godliness will be a magnet for persecution for people who don't like it and, and want to try and knock you down so they can prove that you're wrong. 
and uh, we prove that we're not wrong by just standing and uh, keeping our attitude right in Christ. So we're never kept from suffering or never promised we'll be kept from suffering. That's not what standing means. We are told that we can be kept from devils, though. Uh, we aren't going to necessarily be kept from suffering, but we can be kept from uh, devils having influence over us. One of my favorite passages, uh, one of my favorite memory verses, actually, 2 Thessalonians 3.3, 3. it says, but the Lord is faithful. It says two things that I love. It says, the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. And Paul actually says this right after he is praying that they would be delivered from unreasonable men. He knows, I might not get delivered from unreasonable men, but I will be guarded from the evil one. I think that's awesome. He establishes us in him. That's what we've been talking about in this whole book, that we are seated in Christ. We are established in him. And that means that in him, he establishes you and your job and your relationships and all these things in the earth. He establishes us in all those things as we're established in him. And through those, as we abide in him and stay in him, he guards us from the evil one. In other words, being established in him is what guards us from the evil one. And that's awesome. I have no reasonable expectation that I'm not going to suffer, but I have every expectation that God is able to establish me and guard me from the evil one. So let me pray that for you guys today. Lord, I just pray uh, that you would strengthen us with might through your spirit in the inner man, that we would be strong in you and in the power of your might. Lord, I pray that we would be able to walk in these concepts and in the armor of God, keeping our mind uh, in the position of, of, uh, of rest in you. And Lord, I pray uh, for Church on the Rock especially, for all of us, that we would be established in you, that you would guard us from the evil one, that we would fulfill our ministry and our calling in the name of Jesus. Amen.